And welcome back here. I want to let you know that when we talk about systemic racism, injustice in the criminal justice system, well, you cannot deny the injustice that goes on, particularly with racism in law enforcement, as well as the criminal justice system. The utter failure to acknowledge and effectively address the problem merely causes and contributes to more deaths in the black community at the hands of police. The Jacob Fuchsberg Law Firm is aiming to shed light on systemic racism and also deals with some of the cases like the Dirty 30, the bus drivers, and many others. And here now to provide further insight as the partner of the Jacob Fuchsberg Law Firm, we've got Joseph Lani here with us. And Joseph, good to have you. Good to have, uh, good to be here and good to uh, have this. And if you uh, will, just share a little bit with us about what we talk about uh, systemic racism. Obviously, we talk about racism and the police department. Uh, many people, in it seems as though in New York City, are living in denial, but I know that your work has actually turned up a lot of different results. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, besides the work that is ongoing now uh, with uh, the Jacob D. Fuchsberg Law Firm, my experience uh, with uh, systemic racism in the criminal justice system and in law enforcement in New York dates back to the, the 1990s, more than 25 years. Uh, when I first got involved in uh, bringing cases on behalf of uh, uh, young men who were wrongfully convicted in the Dirty 30 scandal. Uh, and the Dirty 30 scandal involved the 30th Precinct, which covers uh, parts of Harlem and Washington Heights uh, here in New York. Uh, and in, uh, in, in that scandal, 34 police officers were indicted and ultimately I believe 31 were uh, convicted or pled guilty to uh, civil rights violations involving wrongful convictions and wrongful arrests of uh, uh, citizens of New York who were uh, either uh, black or uh, uh, Hispanic. Uh, and I had the privilege of representing uh, two men as lead counsel in lawsuits in federal court against the city of New York and the NYPD, uh, and worked on other cases uh, as one of the co-counsel uh, involved in those cases. They were fascinating cases, and for a lawyer at that time in his 30s, uh, boy, let me tell you, they, they really made me see the, the, see the light. Uh, they were educational, oh boy, they were great experiences. They were great experiences for me because they made the scales fall from my eyes and see what what um, uh, you know what was happening right in front of our faces and and uh, here in New York and the 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 blatant racism of the police department in uh, the way it made war on the community the very community that it was uh, uh, supposed to protect and serve. Well, let me let me throw let me throw this question in here. When we talk about the Dirty Thirty back then, um, that was a major case that dealt with uh, you know criminal justice and racism within the department. But talk to me about that moment and and, and working along that time and compare it to today because obviously uh, where we are today is a whole lot different. But where you were it seems like it was almost the initial phases because finding convictions against police officers was almost like a hard thing to do. Talk about the, the, the hard, you know, the hard pill and the hard rock that you had to roll just to get that. Well, sure. I mean, well, you have to remember that, that I was a, a private lawyer uh, representing these men. Uh, but uh, you know, the Dirty 30 scandal uh, came about by mere accident. What happened was uh, uh, police officers were caught up in a sting operation that was uh, uh, being uh, undertaken by uh, federal law enforcement authorities. Uh, and they were caught selling drugs, <laughs> drugs and guns. Uh, and uh, and uh, ultimately, these officers who were initially caught up in the original sting operation rolled over on uh, their colleagues to avoid long prison terms. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, when many of these officers who turned state's evidence uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, revealed the extent and scale of the corruption in the 30th precinct and how it impacted the lives of these innocent black and, and Latino 
uh, and Hispanic young men in, in, in living in Harlem, Washington Heights, and the Bronx, uh, it, it was uh, an astonishing thing for a person like me. Uh, and it made us uh, work very hard to get these men out of jail. Obviously, they had been sent to jail on uh, concocted evidence and, and uh, false, falsified evidence and perjured testimony. And, uh, and then bring these lawsuits to get them compensation for serving prison time when they, as a result of these wrongful convictions, uh, and you had to get over the bar of qualified immunity, uh, which protects police officers and police departments and municipalities that the municipalities that employ them uh, for wrongful convictions and wrongful arrests and uh, the use of excessive force. How that result? How that impacts upon today? Uh, it's sad to say that uh, even though these cases were successful, uh, they, they really didn't change things. Uh, society continued to ignore the problem, uh, and the problem continued to, continue to exist. And maybe now it, it'll ultimately get addressed with meaningful change. So... That's how I feel. That's how I feel. The, 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 the relationship is that we, we work to help expose the problem, but ultimately, uh, it, it, it ultimately uh, change is only happening now, 25 years later, far too late, and uh, far too many voices that have gone unheard. Well, Joseph, give me a little bit about this, because when we talk about criminal justice reform, it's huge. A lot of voices have been raised, particularly in the area of looking at Rikers Island, things of that nature. How effective is criminal justice reform right now, given the fact that it's been a huge mountain for many people to climb for years? And we're talking about systemic racism that's been going on for years. Well, I think th there are too many voices that are being raised now for those voices to go unheard about the systemic racism in, in law enforcement and the criminal justice system. Uh, I think criminal justice reform uh, is, can be uh, addressed and change can occur uh, by undertaking certain measures uh, that I think will ultimately provide uh, a solution to the problem, but we have to be, we have to continue keeping the pressure on uh, our representative in, representatives in government to affect laws to make that change. For, for instance, uh, I, I, one, one measure, I, I mentioned it in my prior response, was uh, ending qualified immunity for, uh, because right now, uh, qualified immunity uh, allows police officers, police departments, and, and municipalities uh, to avoid accountability for the travesties of uh, injustice that uh, occur every day in America. And, and qualified immunity is a legal doctrine that uh, protects uh, these officers in many cases from lawsuits because it makes it very difficult for uh, the aggrieved citizens and their lawyers to prove cases in court and reach a jury and have a jury decide the cases uh, because it essentially gives these officers the benefit of the doubt. Uh, that, that's essentially the, how I view the impact of qualified immunity. So ending qualified immunity is one thing. Uh, in allowing civil suits for excessive force, for the use of deadly force against innocent unarmed citizens, for wrongful, wrongful convictions, for wrongful arrests, for uh, all sorts of police abuses. Uh, that's, that's one measure. Another measure is that when there are uh, uh, instances of police brutality or police misconduct, such as uh, the, the deaths of uh, uh, innocent unarmed citizens in encounters with the police, uh, it's not to have, not, do not permit the local prosecutor's office to investigate 
and prosecute and and, and determine whether these these cases should be prosecuted against the uh, perpetrating police officers. Uh, why? Because there is too close a relationship between the local prosecutor's offices and the local law enforcement personnel, uh, and very often the cases become buried in the system. So I, I think one measure of addressing the system is to have state attorney generals investigate uh, these cases and prosecute police officers where, uh, where it's indicated, or have the U.S. attorneys, the, the federal uh, uh, system, uh, investigate these, uh, in, these uh, events, these episodes, and prosecute the cases if necessary. Uh, that's, how, that's, that's one measure of, of uh, addressing change. Another measure is, I, I, I believe, obviously training, uh, and certainly a third measure is prison reform, right. uh, which I think is a very important issue because, uh, because uh, what I believe about the situation uh, in, uh, of mass incarceration in the United States is that it's uh, one of the most egregious injustices in the world. And Joseph, let me just jump in here for a second. When we talk about training and we look at numbers, right, uh, it almost seems as though, it's not almost seems as though, it's a fact. When you talk about barbers, it seems as though barbers have to have more hours of training than actual police officers. Isn't there a huge problem with this? Yeah, well, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. I think that uh, with police officers, they're trained in, you know, how to, how to use a gun, how to uh, uh, arrest suspects. Uh, they're trained in everything but the law. Uh, and uh, it seems as though more training should be devoted toward concepts such as probable cause and reasonable suspicion and when it's justified to use force and when it is not justified to use force. I, I, I think you see that time and time again with the instances that, that have recently been in the, in the news. The, the, the George Floyd case, you, we saw a murder uh, on, on national television occurring right before our eyes. There was no reason to exert any force uh, uh, on a uh, on George Floyd, even if uh, you were investigating an alleged crime, uh, there was there was no point in uh, using force on the man. Um, same thing with Eric Garner, uh, uh, and it, we can cite example after example after example. Uh, uh, anyway, that's how I think training is a big part of it, and, yeah. and training on probable cause, uh, reasonable suspicion and when to use force and when it is not justified to use force. Yeah. And Joseph, I want to thank you. Got to leave it there. Thank you so much for being here on the show. Oh, well, uh, you're, you're quite welcome. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Um, and um, if there's anything more you wanted to uh, address with me, I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, speak about it. Joseph Lonnie, our guest here on the show.